All right. What addictions commonly co-occur with sex addiction? Dr. Rob, we're, we're excited to have you with us. Uh, we're going to jump into that. But before we do, I'm going to read a little uh, review and then Ashlyn's going to introduce you once again. Uh, we're just excited to have you back on the podcast because we had such a successful episode with you previous to this. So uh, Brandon, with that, with that question, I'm going to review. Um, okay. So this is called, this review is wow, life changing. It says, my husband told me a month ago that he has been unfaithful for over two years and I have been so devastated and lost. I'm so thankful I found your podcast to help both of us feel that it is possible to recover from betrayal trauma and that these are and, and that there are people out there that have fixed the relationship and made it better and stronger than ever. We are hoping that this or we are hoping that is what we can do as well. We both listen and share what we uh, what we think. Thank you for helping this process for us become more hopeful and positive. We have a lot to still work on, but we are headed in the right direction because of therapy and your podcast. Thank you for being real and open. It has changed our lives. Thank you. Very nice. Wish you guys the very best in the road. It is known. We know it. And um, Well, and finding people. Yeah. That's what really started to shift for me is like, I'm not alone anymore. So, um as Kobe said, we are excited to have, we're going to call you Dr. Rob. It's uh, Dr. Robert Weiss with us. And he uh, shared with us before on pro-dependence. And it was such a game changer for a lot of us to hear um, those theories. And we really appreciate it. So we want him back. Um, he has a ton of experience in all, all these topics. But today we have him. Um, and just so you're aware, Dr. Rob is... Um, a PhD, LCSW, and Chief Clinical Officer of Seeking Integrity. He's the author of 10 books on sexuality, technology, and intimate relationships, including Sex Addiction 101, Out of the Doghouse, and Pro Dependence. And we are going to put all of his information of how you can find him in our show notes um, over on Facebook, YouTube, and iTunes. So let's get started. Hey, so uh, let Dr. Rob, I'll just start by bringing back the question. What are some common co-occurring um, addictions with sex addiction? And, you know, over the years that you've done this, what, 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 what's your experience with that? Well, first of all, I'm so grateful to be here. And I really have a lot of faith in your podcast. And I have also heard good things. And so thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. You know, um, I think any addiction can co-occur with any other addiction. You know, it really depends mm -hmm. on that person's issues. And so, for example, I see people have gaming issues and porn issues. I see people have eating issues and sexual issues. I see people who have drug and alcohol problems and porn or sexual acting out. I mean, it really, it, it isn't really about the issue. It's more about how it plays out for that person. Now, when we say co-occurring disorders, do you think that happens because just the, just the, propensity to want to numb their lives out. So they, they kind of gravitate toward certain things and why, what, why do certain people gravitate toward say meth and sex and food and alcohol? Um, well, I think we have some really underlying, uh, guesses. Um, at least I do, I've done 25 okay. years of clinical work. I have some pretty good guesses. I don't know if the research would all back this up at the moment. I, it's usually, you know, a little behind us, but I can tell you what I see. Um, so why don't we start with, I see in women because women also have sexual issues and women also sexually act out about 30%, 30% of my practice has always been women. And, you know, women are not always the first to come up and they have, say they have a sexual problem because you know what we'd say about a woman like that. Right. And so, but I tell you what, I've been seeing a lot of them online because women feel really safe coming online and talking about issues because they're not in a church basement. They're not in some therapist's office with five other people. It's really a gift that people are joining us here. Right. Um, but what I see in women in particular um, is co-occurring issues with food and sex. Um, mm. And I think this is makes a lot of sense to me because our earliest experiences in life are have to do with being held and sensual issues, which is touch and sensuality, sexuality in adult life and eating, you know, eating is the most essential way we first er, er, learn in early life that people are going to respond to us. They're going to be there for us. They're going to see our needs. Gonna, all of that stuff really revolves in the earliest stages around comfort, sensuality, and, and food. So I understand when I see a man or a woman with those issues, it often tells me that they were harmed probably long before they can remember. Um, and some really difficult things happen to them. That's when totally you me. 
totally me. When you like talk just, about, yeah. oh, sorry, Kobe. Brandon, go ahead. Um, when you talk about women and issues with food, um, co-occurring with sexual addiction, um, the issues with food, I mean, do we, do you see both deprivation and eating disorders along with compulsive overeating as well? It, it kind of goes both directions, right? Well, there's binge purge, right? right? And that's what overeaters often do. And so, and this is how it works. This is how they fit together. Not always, but I work a lot of women who um, they're kind of desperately searching, desperately searching for a relationship. Um, they're slim, they're going out, they're having sex with lots of people, you know, they're all over Tinder, whatever it is. And then they meet someone and they get involved and they have intimate feelings and they start to grow together. And then because of this person's issues, she starts to feel uncomfortable. The intimacy is too close. She doesn't feel comfortable with it. It's overwhelming to her. She doesn't feel like she has, you know, because of her early issues. And so what does she do to push that man away? She eats. And if she eats enough, she will physically be away from him. And he's going to look at her and say, you know, I wasn't really in this for someone who is as heavy as you are. I, I, this doesn't work for me. And once that person's gone, male or female, guess what she does? She loses all this weight and she runs out there looking for intimacy relationships and sex. And often women will bounce back and forth between these two issues. That's interesting. You're, I mean, you're really describing how food addiction is kind of used as a, as an intimacy disorder or an attachment that they're using it to push away. Um, and so it it looks like a food addiction, but it has the same type of roots as a sex addiction. Um, so yeah. So let me just say this. I think all addictions, and this is me, right? 25 years of experience. This is my belief, right or wrong. I think all addictions come early, come from early attachment damage. I don't think any of us with addiction didn't have early damage to the primitive part of our brains when we should have been learning how free we were, how fun life was, how we had no responsibilities, and then everyone would turn to us as the most important person in the world, because you are when you're three. For whatever reason, we didn't have that, and we didn't have it in a really challenging way. And the reason that I think all addicts have underlying issues like this is very simple to me. Healthy people, the ones I've met anyway, when they have a bad day or they have a great day or their dog died or, they got a, or they're got they going to have a baby, they the first thing they do is run to other people and say, guess what happened to me? Guess what's going on with me? Or, you know, I'm feeling really bad and I need comfort. And then they, they go get the dog it. and they reach out to people. Yeah, and you connect. have to understand, here's a way it goes, right? If, I, if my dog died, very sad. And I just sat alone and said, wow, it's really sad that my dog died. I might want to go drink or use um, because I just feel terrible all by myself. But if I put the, my dog's pictures on Facebook and I tell everybody how much I love them and then people come back and say, I'm so sad. That must be so hard for you. I loved your dog. All of that. That is the grounding piece for human beings because without that, we feel out of control. We cannot fully soothe ourselves by ourselves. Yes. That is a myth. We need other connections and people to soothe us. But addicts don't reach toward those connections. Addicts are in stress or in joy, and they say, I need to run off somewhere by myself and deal with these feelings. I don't want to run to other people because then I would be vulnerable. And when I run to addiction, whether it's alcohol, drug, sex, I'm in control. I'm in control of how I feel. Because think about it. If I have a great thing to say or a terrible thing to say and I go to you and you disappoint me or let me down, that's going to be a lot like what I grew up with. But if Mm -hmm. I turn to something as reliable as food, drugs, or sex, nobody's going to let me down. Nobody's going to make me feel bad or abandon me but also I don't get fed with the health of connection. It's interesting just listening to this, Dr. Rob, because uh, I can, I can with, with 100% surety identify with what you're talking about as far as food is being there. And it's an interesting dynamic for me personally, having, you know, recovered um, and then still being focused day to day on recovery. My mom was a bulimic and I've searched so hard to try to understand and remember if there has been any additional traumas that I can remember. And I can't, aside from just essentially little T's versus like big T's, right? Little traumas versus big traumas that I can remember anyways. But when you talk about um, this whole um, eating thing, um, just in reference, right? I can, this is how I can describe it for me, from my experience is it's like having this deep, chasm for which I can't see the bottom and I'm trying to fill it with food and I will be sick from what I've eaten 
before I ever feel like that uh, hole has been uh, filled or has been satiated in any way. But and that's it's just this like empty bottom pit. But that's like so going to food or sex when I'm emotionally empty. It's like eating potato chips when you're hungry. It may for the moment satisfy that yearning for connection, which is what it is, that yearning to be soothed. It may fill you up, but it's empty. And if you go home and you have nothing more than that, you're going to get sicker and sicker and sicker. So what we hunger for is the nurturing connection of other people on every level. Mm -hmm. That's so fascinating. I I want to come back to something you said earlier, and it's about reliability. Um, You know, our, our, our relationships are, are vulnerable. Um, Connection is, is vulnerable. And we may get rejected, we may get abandoned, um, but that bottle will, all you have to do is crack that open and, and it will be there. Um, all you have to do is think about it and you will feel better. Yeah, just think about it. You'll start getting the juices flowing in your brain, right? Um, so, uh, you know, so the, uh, it, Dr. Rob, would, would it, could I say that in order for an addict to, to really get in recovery and gain some sobriety, you're going to have to face the um, unreliability of what connection is. So that they're going to have they're going to have to have some courage to step into some healthy relationships and connection in sure. order to gain that sobriety. Well, if you look at twelve step meetings, right, and take the steps out and take the spirituality out, what are people doing? They're coming together with a common problem, whereas before they used to isolate with their problems. Yes. If you ask me what God is, I'll tell you, it's when two or more people together seeking healing and you can watch that healing happen. That's what God is for me. And so I don't think there's any mistake in when we are working with mentally ill people or addicted people and they're really troubled. The first thing we do is bring them into groups and have them connect with other people because that's what they're most missing and have missed for a long time. Yeah. And good treatment provides that, by the way. In a good treatment center, you're not just sitting and doing your work. A lot of treatments say, oh, we have lots of individual individual therapy. You're going to have yoga and massage. I want to be sitting in the group with the other people getting challenged, growing relationships, struggling. I think that's where the the work is. I could not agree with you more on that. Um, So so let's let's shift a little bit. And and I'm curious, because I treated drug and alcohol addiction for the first six years of, of my career. And... And I did see a lot of, uh, I would say, many of the the drug addicts and the alcoholics that I worked with had compulsive sexual behaviors as well. Um, uh, I guess what why what I see I see that a meth addict oftentimes is a meth addict, an alcoholic is an alcoholic. Now that there's there's the poly substance users that use everything, right? But it seems garbage, like garbage, garbage can addicts, garbage can addicts. Yes. Whatever's there, in there, they'll pull out. Right? There's such a thing. But, but for the most part, what I saw was people would gravitate towards certain things. There was, there was the potheads, there was the tweakers there, right? What, whatever we want to call them. But, but it seemed like sex or sex addiction, um, didn't discriminate that, um, you know, it would kind of go throughout everybody and kind of meet their needs in some way. Is that accurate, Dr. Rob? Well, naturally occurring functions like sex and food, we, you know, from recovery, we don't just stop. Um, Alcohol and drugs, you can stop. Gambling, you can stop. But I don't want a healthy person to stop eating and I don't want them to stop being sexual. So I don't know if I answer your question or not. I think the, the basic issues are the same for all of us addicts, which is we learned very early on that we were not gonna be comforted and soothed by others on some level. And we had to go somewhere in our heads to disappear so that we would feel better. I used to stare out the window for hours. I used to count cars and check off boxes. That's an LTD. That's a Falcon. I know you don't, want, you don't know what those are, but I, <laughs> I know exactly what those are. An LTD, that's I old was, school. <laughs> but you know, when I was six years old and my parents locked me in my room and they didn't want anything to do with me because I'm not sure they really wanted to have a kid. And then they were in the next room screaming at each other. And I was locked in my room at six Where was I going to go? Who was I going to talk to? What was going to make me feel better? And this is when children use what is a naturally occurring function that's good for them, which is fantasy, because in fantasy, you can be a fireman, you can be your mom, you can do all kinds of things, and that's good for kids. But when you have to use fantasy as a means of survival, to go out that window, to dissociate, to go anywhere outside, you've learned something. 
And that learning, I think, is I have this place where I can take myself that secret and it's just mine and I can go there and I'm going to feel better. Sometimes for people that involve sexual stimulation, they rub up against the bed, they masturbate because kids do do that. Um, but uh, it is that kind of early damage. And, and I want to answer your question too. I'm sorry. Um, why would I be a meth addict as opposed to an alcoholic? I mean, first of all, there are biological issues there. So I, I could never be an alcoholic. When I have a glass of wine, I get a headache, I get tired. I am not built for alcohol. Some people have very high tolerance to alcohol. They can drink and drink and drink. I get the headache and the bad feelings within half an hour. So I would never make a good alcoholic, but maybe I'd want to do meth or speak. I mean, something else to escape. Right. So I think people do what comes most, what comes easily to them. And that's the way they tend to abuse. Um, but you asked like four do, questions do, in there. So do, let do me answer think, one more. Oh, go okay, ahead. Go ahead. Well, do you think so like, you know, sex can, can meet many needs. So it can satiate it can give you arousal. It can take you to a place of fantasy. It can um, educate. It, it can educate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, for a meth addict, would they be more likely to act out in certain ways sexually than say an alcoholic? Well, let's just um, for a minute, talk about drug and alcohol, drugs and alcohol related to sex. I've right. seen a lot of people with these issues and a lot of them, first of all, coming to sex addiction treatment over the years have told me probably three quarters of them, to be honest, have said, I had a drug and alcohol problem, but I've been sober three years, five years, seven years, but I'm not happy, joyous, and free. I've been lying. I've been cheating. I, my life is not right. Mm -hmm. And so they get to those other issues after a few years of sobriety. But there are people who cannot stay sober because of their sexual issues. And they go to a wonderful treatment center that's great at treating drugs and alcohol, but the staff has no idea how to talk about sex, what to do with it. And it's embarrassing for that person. You're not going to bring it up in a bunch of alcoholics. So I really think a lot of people go to treatment and they only get half of what they need. And they may have learned how to stop using, but they have no idea how to connect with people. They may be still mm. using sex workers and that's where the drugs are, you know, so um, I think on every level, it, it can come after, it can come with. Um, I want to ask you a question about co which drugs co-occur with which issues, but I feel like I'm talking too much. So if you want to ask a question, I'll come back to that. <laughs> okay. I, I think you keep talking. That's why you're here. <laughs> so um, I work with meth addicts. I work with straight men who are meth addicts and gay men that are meth addicts. Everyone hears meth addiction are like gay guys. No, I've worked with plenty of straight guys and they have the same issues. They have sexual trauma, early abuse, attachment right. issues. Right. And when they're under stress, the straight guys go to motels and watch porn and pick up sex workers for a couple of days and they use meth. And the, the gay guys go, you know, go to the bathhouse and like wherever they go and they're using meth. So it isn't related necessarily to orientation, but what it is related to is deeply held sexual problems. Um, the people that we treat, and I run a treatment center called Seeking Integrity. That's why I'm Rob at Seeking Integrity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, our goal is to not just treat the sex addiction. I've been doing that for 20 or 25 years, but to really help people understand the co-occurring because I have not run into anyone who comes to us for drug and alcohol issues, but they know they have sex problems who doesn't really have sexual problems. So let me give an example. A lot of the gay men I work with often come from very conservative backgrounds, very religious backgrounds, and they learned early on to hate themselves. They learned that, you know, from the church, from the you know, homosexuality is wrong, you know, and this is still true today. Right. And so even if they come out and go through a life where they feel good about themselves, for many of them, there's this deep seated feeling of, I don't like sex. I don't want to have, I feel icky. I don't, something's, you know, they haven't dealt with the homophobia, but then they find meth. And you know what meth does for you? It doesn't just disinhibit you like alcohol does. It makes you feel like sex is amazing. Yeah. And with Viagra and those kind of drugs, people can get up, get it up for days and have it up for days. If I, mm -hmm. you know, or they're up for days and up for days. So what they're not dealing with is their deep seated discomfort with their own sexuality, because when they're high, they, they feel great. It's like, okay, yeah. now I enjoy all the sex and now I don't feel bad at all. But when you remove the drugs, you still have somebody who's homophobic or sexually abused or mm -hmm. is trans or whatever their issue is, and it's still flo floating down beneath the surface. But the meth just kind of overrides all that for that moment, for that when, when they're high, it's just, it's okay. Things are good. Things feel good. Everything's okay. Yeah. Everything's I mean, fine. meth, you have to understand um, nicotine is uh, our most addictive substance 
of them all, more than heroin, more than any of them. That's why we all, that's why they had ashtrays in our cars for years and years and right, years. Isn't that crazy? And it was just expected that everyone would smoke forever. But the next most addictive is meth. And the challenge with that is that like unlike, her unlike heroin or opiate addicts um, who can use medications to reduce withdrawal, we have nothing for speed addicts. So when they stop using, they just feel terrible. I mean, awful, because if you've been running out your brain chemistry by feeling great for a long time, what's going to be on the other side of it is a lot of depression. And there's nothing we can do to help them because they have literally burned out parts of their brain. It's the parts that enjoy pleasure. And right. it's going to be a while before their brains restore themselves. By the way, meth addicts, when they're sober, often don't enjoy anything. They yeah. don't want to have sex anymore. They don't enjoy friends. They feel awful for a long time. Yeah. And they wonder what's wrong with them. They've hurt their brains. Right. What would you say is, is I'm just going to ask a basic question here. What is it easier to get sober from, drugs and alcohol, or to, to, to not act out sexually? Well, I certainly don't want to diminish the experience of any drug addict or alcoholic who's sure. had to recover. I'm that's sorry, I don't, want to, I don't want to set you up here, Dr. Rob. No, it's okay. I yeah. notice I'm taking care of myself. Yes. Um, <laughs> Good for you. And I also don't believe ever that I can compare my pain to someone else's pain. You know, my pain is my pain. Their pain is their pain. But I can tell you that structurally, it's easier to recover from drugs and alcohol simply mm -hmm. because... While you may see billboards, you may see bars, you may see bottles, you can live your life perfectly well. I know alcoholics and drug addicts don't feel this way, but you can live a really great life and never use again. If you're a compulsive gambler, you don't have to play cards anymore. You don't have to go to casinos, no fantasy football, no stock market, and life is pretty good. But if you have an eating disorder or a sexual disorder, as I said earlier, the solution is not to stop. It's to integrate those things into your life in a healthy way, which means that the, the food addict, the sex addict, they have to face these issues every single day. How much do I eat? Should I eat? Should I be sensual by partner? Should I, you know, it's not like that's, oh, look at that billboard. That kind of turns me on. That never goes away. Right. So these are chronic lifelong problems that are, are more difficult to um, change because they are so much part of our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, you can move point. out of a life that involves alcohol all the time. You can move out of a life that involves gaming all the time, but you cannot move out of a life that involves sexuality or or eating that's part of life right that's a really challenging uh place to be in and, and i know for ashlyn i have discussed this many times dr rob that it's like okay we're we're in recovery we're feeling really good and we're making headway both of us from betrayal and from addiction but then when um it really became uh noticeable that i was gaining weight it was like well wait a second there was numbing with food that took place while you were acting out an addiction. And it really appears as kind of the same behaviors are taking mm -hmm. place again uh, because of the, because of the additional uh, food binging. How do I make sense of this? Is, is something happening? Does that make sense? Like, well, it's kind of like a binge purge, right? I binge on sex. And then when I put that down, I got to find something else. I mean, it's all about relieving pain, right? Yes, yes. So you may purge yourself of all the sexual behavior, but all of it, but the hole in the soul, the emptiness that came about very early on and lingers with us for the rest of our lives, that longing to connect, that loneliness, that feeling like nobody will understand us. And I'm the loneliest person at a party, you know, if surrounded by people, I mean, that goes, that's a lifelong challenge. And when that spills, because we have an emotional illness with drugs and alcohol under stress, we devolve, you know, it, look, if you have a kid who is no longer bedwetting and they're seven years old and they're doing great, but grandma dies or there's a car accident, you may find that they're bedwetting again because under mm -hmm. stress, human beings with, um, we move backward um, a little bit in our development. So I can understand how a mentally ill or an addictive person when facing great stress um, we'll kind of move back into the old behaviors that made them feel okay, even though intellectually it doesn't appeal to them. Does that, does that mean then that like, if I'm married to an addict, then it's hopeless. Like when, when hopeless, in, yeah. I'm, I'm, what's, ho I'm, what's hopeless. No, you I'm can just, say, it, but what did you mean? Well, what I, what I mean is like, well, he's going to relapse. He's going to, when he gets so really what? stressed, when he really, so what? Right, right. This is so a conversation what? I want to have. You so, married this person. You're in a committed relationship with this person. If they're not continually betraying you personally, and if they really don't intend to, this is what a marriage is. You know, marriages right. are not all sunshine and moonbeams. Sometimes a marriage is your client, your partner has cancer. Sometimes they have an addiction. 
So right. this whole message we gave with codependency, which was like, if there's something wrong with you, if you live and love an addict, I don't think that's really the case. So, um, yeah, I have no idea what I'm saying, but that well, seemed about well, right. There's, <laughs> there's something, there's something you said earlier, which is, which is absolutely true. Um, we, we are sex, sexual beings and we're also human beings that eat food and there's no way around that. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but oftentimes with, especially with a very, uh, kind of rigid belief system or very religious conservative belief system. Um, what I see a lot of times is is a sex addict um, who's in a marriage try to act like he's not sexual, and that somehow mm -hmm. is sobriety, and mm -hmm. and and it creates this. I mean, I mean, the relationship does not move forward because he he's acting like he has no sexual triggers, like there's no nothing going on with him sexually at all, and it's just not reality. It's just not. Yes, the case. well. What partner, what husband, what wife doesn't want to convince the person they live with that they're perfectly fine? This is the right. story with everyone I've ever worked with. You have a betrayed spouse, female or male, and they want to hear that this is never going to happen again. And if it is, does, I'm leaving you. Right. And my response to that is, well, are, you're basically telling this person that you don't want to know if they're struggling because you've told them you're going to leave them. if they, you, So you're setting up lies. Right. And um, look, there is a difference between a slip and a relapse. You know, I might have my mother might die. I might have an awful day. My wife's having a baby and I'm just terrified. I might go off into old behavior. I might look at porn. I might go to a strip club, whatever. But a slip is I realize that I feel bad about it. I go to my, my therapist, the people who you support me. It. I talk about it. And then I go to my wife or husband and I say, I'm really sorry, but I have to tell you this happened. And I'll tell you what, you say that it's devastating and hopeless for the spouses. I don't agree at all because what I hear them say is, you know, I really hate that you did that. And it really is the kind of stuff that makes me hate myself and hate you. But it's interesting because this is the first time you've been honest with me about it. This is the first time you've really talked about it. And what spouses who are betrayed most want is trust and honesty. I Absolutely. know you guys feel bad about what we did, but more than that, when we go sexually act out, we break your trust. Yes. And that's, and if we can just learn honesty. So that's what a slip is relapse is different. It's when I return to an old behavior and I don't tell anybody and I don't seek help and I, and my spouse doesn't know. And then I'm setting myself up to keep doing it. Right. Yes. And I said that tongue in cheek, it is like, you know, when a spouse says, well, it's hopeless, they're just going to relapse. No, it's not hopeless when, when your partner slips and if they're honest with you and they work through that, it actually can build some connection and some trust in that relationship. Yeah, but you you try to tell that to a woman who's been married to some guy for 20 years and he's been cheating for 18. Exactly. That is not what she wants to hear. And exactly. she's not going to want to hear that for a long time. Right. And understand that if you're a spouse, you look at it, unless you really understand addiction, it's still like an affair. It's like you could stop that and love me. The idea right. that this can be compulsive or addictive is really hard for most people to understand. And yes, you're asking a spouse to understand you and feel sorry for you because you have a problem at the same time that they hate your guts and you've ruined their lives. Yes. This is why, by the way, we cannot turn to our spouses for support at this time. We need to turn to other people Our uh, yeah, because spouses need to go off and, and rage at us and we need to go go around and get support for their anger. <laughs> and, and and that's what I was saying is it's absolutely valid and okay if they're upset by a slip. If they're if they're oh yeah. You know, and, and, and and they, they can leave. And yeah, they can leave if yeah. that doesn't work for them. Absolutely. Can I uh, but I'll tell you oh sorry. Sorry, I, I'm just being quiet over here because I'm actually feeling a lot of emotion around this, Dr. Rob. And I, I really hope our listeners are hearing and feeling what I'm feeling. Uh, just like, I love that you are uh, just direct, that you are, I can feel your compassion. Sorry. For both sides. And I really value that. Um, I've struggled. We don't talk about this on the podcast very often because we have gone to that place where I say, What's missing? What is missing? What's connection? What, are, what do we not have that you're going to food and mm -hmm. not me? Um, so this well, is- What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? It's scary. What's wrong with the that? The fear, right? What is wrong with your saying, what can I do? What can we do? How can we, in order to help you with your eating? The Why does that not work? <laughs> no. no, because I can't he'll eat whether it. he's, he's going to eat whether he's with you or not. He's going to eat at work. He's, he had an eating problem before you ever met. He would right. have this problem with someone else. And I have to say again, 
that no partner should ever feel that they are responsible for someone else's addiction. You are never responsible right. for our addictions. Never. I don't care what they say under codependency. I, you can be mean to me. You can gain weight. You can not have sex with me. You can yell at me all the time and I can go out and play golf. I can get a hobby. I can divorce you. There are a lot of things I can do, but get drunk, uh, say, have sex with other people and eat. When I do that, that's my decision, right or wrong. Right. It's my decision. And there, and it affects you and it hurts you, but it is never your fault. Right. And I understand that part. It's the, like what you said earlier, I've asked Kobe, are you unintentionally pushing me away and, and waiting for me to say, oh my gosh, you've gained a hundred pounds when I'm not doing that because I am okay with a hundred pounds and I love him just the same, but it, it does. He's pushing bring... away his feelings, which he's pushing away his feelings, which by nature pushes you away. Right. Sorry, I, I interrupted this, you. No, I just, I, I know because of the women that I work with, this is the, w more common. I mean, a lot of them that I work with, their husbands have sex addiction and, and other alcohol or, or drugs, but most often it's food. And it's that longing of, I don't know what we're supposed to be doing here. They've really had great sobriety in this. And then, like you said, they still have to eat and they're unhappy and they're frustrated and they don't know what to do. Um, my question to you is when you come, when you have people that come to your seeking integrity clinic and they have these multiple, um, coexisting addictions, where do you guys start? And is it different depending on the person? what you treat first? Well, I think it's seeking integrity. First of all, I've been doing this a long time. So I think we've got the work pretty down. Um, and I feel really good about it. I do it in small groups, not big, you know, we don't have a huge place, like a hundred people good for COVID. Um, <laughs> but, um, I totally forgot the question you asked. So can you ask me again? How do, yeah. So what are you treating first when people come in with co? Right. Okay. So understand that if someone comes in with a drug or alcohol problem, I cannot help them with um, food, sex, gambling, gaming, any of the process addictions, because the minute they have a drink or get high, they are disinhibited. And so that work that that part of their brain, the intellectual part that says, I don't think it's a good idea. Here's some things to do, you know, get out of this is taken over because we don't have access to it because we're loaded. And then we come from our emotions, which is, oh, this looks really good. I'm going to do it. And our intellect retreats into the background. Um, yeah. I tried, to do, I tried to do a therapy session once with a person that I realized they were drunk um, mm. and, and we didn't really process much or get into much um, because they were drunk. And so right. uh, they got to get, they got to, there's got to be some level of sobriety to start to do some work. Right. And like they're getting loaded is a loss to them. You know, it's, it's their choice, you know, in that moment. And, and I want to say to you, you know, Ashlyn, I don't think that any of us are stepping away from our partners when we do what we do. We're stepping away from ourselves. Um, we hurt ourselves. We abandon ourselves. We're running to something that's never going to make us feel better. And honestly, we're not thinking about you. You know, part of addiction is being so actually, let me tell you a little bit about mental health, a little bit about mental health. Um, we kind of run the gamut from being really intellectual to being really emotional. And when you're fully in your emotions, you're not really able to help yourself because you're overwhelmed, you're upset, you're, you're raging, you're crying, you know, and really you need to be kind of pulled back into a place where your brain can help you negotiate your emotions. If you're completely intellectual, you can talk your way through addiction, you can talk your way through hurting people, you can talk your way through anything because you're not connecting to your emotional self that says that's going to hurt somebody and why. So really mental health is about being able to be in that balance of being able to think about my choices, but also enjoy and move into the emotions that I feel knowing that they're safe and not going to hurt anybody. Um, and this is part of the work. In answer to your question, um, so I said I have to treat the drug and alcohols first, but I also, you know, there's a reason we have a treatment center for drugs and alcohol. Um, I will it's not that hard to do relapse prevention work to help people with addiction. It really, it should be like a quarter of the work. Most of it should be focused on trauma and relationships yes. and sexual and what's going on in treatment and everything that's happening in front of us here and now and in the past. But if I don't teach that piece about relapse prevention and what addiction is about, I've not given the person the tools to not drink and not use. So it doesn't matter how much I work on trauma or earlier issues or because they don't have the container to hold on mm -hmm. to all of that. Right. Oftentimes it feels like they just want the tools 
And, but what what they realize is even when they just get the tools to stay sober, um, they don't maintain sobriety unless, unless you do the trauma work, unless you go deeper after things. Well, I think we have a pretty high failure rate in our treatment centers. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a good reason for that. You know, we have not always brought mental health people in. And I got to tell you, like, I've seen some folks go through in the major treatment centers and then come to us. And it's really clear. No one identified Asperger's. Nobody identified yeah. depression. Nobody identified OCD, or obsessive compulsive. And so this person would have never gotten better unless somebody's there to really do a thorough evaluation. And I think sometimes people walk into a center like, oh, you got a drug problem. All the drug addicts have a drug problem. Let's treat you all like this. Mm -hmm. And the universality of the problem doesn't hold water when you're looking at the individual. Each one of us has different pain, different trauma. And so you really can't you can build relationships and help people heal in their groups, but you also help to help them individually to understand where this all came from and yeah. how to not do it again. Yeah, that's a great point. I look at those. At, I, I mean, I, what you just said, Doctor Rob, is um, really resonates with me. Although I have not been in treatment, but have um, worked with a lot of guys who have, and that is the 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 common denominator with all of them with whom I've worked is that they've received treatment they've been able to think clear more clearly because they're sober but um but what still remains are the wounds that were the impetus behind the acting out to begin with um and are are how many, how many addicts that are, are, you know, or patients that come into your treatment center understand that wait, that's... Wait. I want to respond to what you just said, which okay. is, I don't think most people know why they drink and use. Uh, yeah. Maybe they'll see it as an emotional escape or I'm, you know, right. it's taught to you that you're uncomfortable and you're, but what using and drinking and sex and all uh, in an addictive way is really all about is, again, trying to make myself feel better in the absence of using the thing that will help us know most better, which is a connection to people. And so it doesn't really matter the addiction. What matters is the, they all join in what they mean to us, which is I can go off and make myself feel better and I don't have to rely on anyone. I don't have to depend on anyone. No one's going to let me down. When I go into 12 step programs and therapy, it's all about building relationships, being responsible, being accountable to other people. Mm -hmm. When I go off and use, I, I don't, I'm not worried about when I come late or who, who I'm not accountable to anybody. But in those relationships, in those support groups, I'm accountable to lots of people. And believe it or not, that begins to make me think about, oh, if I do this, maybe it'll hurt this person because I see them in front of me and I'm engaged with them. So to, to, to follow up with that, then when, when people in your treatment centers, when they really understand that, okay, 25% of my time here is, is, is devoted to relapse prevention and the tools they're in, mm -hmm. but the real work that they have to face are the whole in the soul, as you, as you uh, called it. The, they have to work on the traumas for the deep wounds. How many of them are, really know that they have wounds that need to be healed? And when they understand that piece, how do they typically respond? Well, I want to say something, two things about trauma. And one of them is the answer to your question. Uh, I think that maybe half the people I come, I, who come to Seeking Integrity have been in some therapy, they've done some work on themselves, they understand a little bit about where it happened, but the other half, I have to tell you, I walk into 40 year old men who say to me, I had an alcoholic dad, he used to beat me, I had a mom who was never around, um, my brother used to you know, run away and we were always worried about him, we had no money and, and it was awful, but when I was 20, I made a decision. I'm done with that. I'm pushing that all away. I'm not going to let that affect me anymore. And I'm going to go forward and have a good life. I had a client like this, two kids at home. Well, he came to us because he was engaging in domestic violence. He was hitting his spouse. He was drinking and he had a sex problem because as much as you might want to will yourself into getting past the past, it will always be reflect reflected in your adult life until you deal with it. Um, and, and the other thing about trauma, I think this is so important for us to understand. And I think that anybody who says that they can do the thing I'm about to tell you you can't do is not really telling you the truth. Um, we don't ever heal trauma. We don't. We learn how to adapt to it, how to understand it, how to, how to manage it so it doesn't interfere with our lives, how to see it coming. But you know, if you cut me deeply on my arm when I was seven, I'm going to have a scar. Mm -hmm. And if you, if my brain doesn't, 
isn't allowed to go where it needs to go, but has to move into protection and safety and self, you know, all that. I'll never evolve in adult life the way I would if I could have had what I needed at two or three or four, because I'm never going to be that age again. But you can help me to identify when trauma is being triggered. You can help me feel less shame mm -hmm. because, oh, I'm not a bad person. I do bad things because bad things happen to me. Um, there are a lot of uses for trauma and in the long term, certainly working through it. But I don't think working through it ever means eliminating it. Um, I think it means learning to adapt to it, to change your behaviors around it, to seek support around it, and to understand what it means. Um, and maybe the triggers can be turned down so that there isn't so much reactivity in situations like EMDR, where you can you hear the voice or the problem, but it isn't quite as loud, but not all of it. Some of the larger pieces like neglect, which can go on for years, as opposed to one thing that happens, like a, a, a abuse of some kind of single incident, those are easier to handle um, than they are long-term abuse. Mm -hmm. yeah. I really uh, like by the way, oh, go ahead. <laughs> the most profound abuse that I see is neglect mm -hmm. without question. So, okay, mm -hmm. can you what does that look like when you say the most profound? Say more, please. Well, neglect means that uh, there wasn't going to be around to there wasn't anyone around or there wasn't consistency around me in a way that left me feeling good about myself. And so, you know, if you're a latchkey child or if there's nobody nurturing you or taking care of you, I have a client right now who he grew up his whole life afraid because his mom had the kind of job which would take her out of town for a week at a time. And she started traveling when he was three. He thought that meant she was gonna die and never come back. She would leave all the time. No one explained to him why she was leaving. He thought she was never gonna come back because you know, when mom's gone for a few days, she's a little bit out of mind and you get scared. Young children shouldn't be away from their mothers for long periods of time, certainly not days and days. So, but he didn't understand all of this. He just said, you know, childhood mom was there, they made money, you know, they put me in school, they gave me things, life wasn't bad. It wasn't until we asked him what it was like. And by the, I want to add to this. Um, I have frequently have clients who've been molested at eight or 10 or six. And they say to me, well, other than that molestation at eight or 10 or six, I had a great childhood, everything was fine. You know, but that was, and I'll say, well, who did you talk to about it? Who did you reach out to? Who knew about your pain? Who saw you struggling? Oh, well, I didn't want to tell anybody. You know, and it's like, well, why wouldn't you? If you love your parents, if you feel nurtured by them. And in this way, I'm trying to help them understand that what happened to them in eight is a full reflection. It's not just that, that they have a history. And by the way, the kids who get molested, histories of neglect, histories of abuse, mm -hmm. they don't see the bad people, but the bad people see them right mm -hmm. away because they're people with a hole in the soul, the neediest kids out there who are looking for an adult to make them feel good. And there's that perpetrator. So um, I'm not sure I went there, but I think that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. I've really enjoyed this, Dr. Rob, and um, just your experiences and knowledge in sharing it with us and our audience. And I really hope that they um, have taken whatever they need to from this conversation and know that they can find you. And if they want to seek help for these problems, they can. Um, well, I'm not hard to find. <laughs> um, I have a pretty popular podcast. We've had almost 500,000 downloads. So I consider that to be okay. That's it's awesome. called Sex. Thank you. It's called Sex, Love, and Addiction. And on the podcast, I have some of the most famous therapists in the world, I think. Uh, Stan Katkin, Sue Johnson, Helen Fisher, like lots of really famous wow. gurus. Gurus to us, anyway, may not yeah. gurus to you. And we're talking about addiction, intimacy, relationships, healing, um, trauma, um, female porn addict, you know, all of it. And I think we're popular because we're telling truth. Yeah. You know, no offense, but a lot of podcasts are about entertainment or politics or clothes. And that's interesting. Right. But I think when people really hear truth, they want to go and listen because it's hard to find. Yeah. yeah. Um, sure. we'll, we'll make sure that we put uh, links uh, to your social media, um, to your site, uh, you know, as far as seeking integrity is concerned for the treatment center, all those resources. Honestly, we just super appreciate, number one, your willingness to come back and share with us. Yeah. Appreciate your efforts in this arena because people need hope desperately. And hope. Um, so, so that's really my last question just in closing is um, I think everybody, no matter where you are in life, you, whether you recognize it now or maybe in future, everyone will have um, a loved one, a family member, uh, a neighbor, a friend that is dear to them that will struggle with anything that we've talked about today, mm -hmm. um, where can the, the betrayed partner and where can the addict find hope? 
Um, well, first of all, I think, first of all, if you educate yourself, I think that's the best mm -hmm. initial tool because if someone's betrayed you and they say they're a sex addict, what the hell does that mean? You know, you cheated on me. You're going to call it a problem. That's just letting you off the hook. You know, so I think educating yourself about what addiction is about, how people really don't have control because when you love someone, you think, well, if you love me enough, you would stop that. And it really doesn't have anything to do with how much I love you. It's my brokenness. So I think education is important. Um, one of the things I want to tell you that we've done, just take a minute is um, I have a great obligation I feel to people who are healing. And so I created a website where we do service. I found 14 lazy therapists and I put them to work. And every week we do live groups at no cost for male sex addicts, for female sex addicts, for partners. We do webinars for couples. We do groups for male betrayed people. I mean, we have about 14 groups a week. And I wanted to create a place because you know, when I was in early recovery, which was a long time ago, there was Pat Carnes, there was Claudia Black, there were all these famous people, John Bradshaw, but I couldn't talk to them. I couldn't ask them questions. I could only go to one of their seminars or maybe get a therapist to train them. But now, I, honest to God, anyone come online for an hour or two um, and talk to me and I can answer questions. And I think just getting clarity like we're doing here brings people hope because we have hope. We're all sitting here and we've all been challenged in the way that we're talking about, but we're still sitting here and we still care and love about each other, love each other and it's working. So, you know, it's just a little bit of time, a lot of patience, a lot of love and tolerating sometimes the intolerable for a little while. Beautiful. I, um, can I make a suggestion before we wrap up? Um, sure. I, I attended a conference where Dr. Rob was the keynote speaker uh, it was like 11 years ago <laughs> and, and, and I went, I, I'd heard of you before and I went and I listened, you spoke for like an hour. And, um, after that, uh, to be honest with you, I kind of had a headache, um, because <laughs> thanks <laughs> got them really good. Right. <laughs> no, listen, Pull out the Anderson for the whole crowd. <laughs> Advil for the whole crowd. <laughs> the compliment is coming. So <laughs> it, it was because it was so rich and so much and, and, uh, just what we've talked about today, just in the, in, in, in the time that we've had, Dr. Rob has hit on so many things. And, uh, and I think the beauty of a podcast is you can go back and listen. I, I remember uh, one of the only times I've actually gone back and reviewed the slides of a speaker was that conference. And, and I got so many rich pieces of things that I still use in my practice today. So um, just, just the depth in which you've talked about addiction today. And we've even talked a lot about the betrayal side of things as well. Um, I, I, I'd encourage you to, to listen back and really understand the things that Dr. Rob is saying. Love Thank that. you. It's okay. been a real honor to, to be here and I'm looking forward to, you know, you can ask me again. I will come okay. back. <laughs> oh, you're wonderful. All right. well, By the we way, appreciate if, anyone wants, if anyone wants to find our treatment center, we are www.seekingintegrity.com. Uh, the website, I'm mean, sorry, the free website is sexandrelationshiphealing.com, sexandrelationshiphealing. Um, I have a blog that's been going eight years in psychology today. I'm not hard to find. Just type in Dr. Rob and sex and you will find me. <laughs> you won't find anything personal, but you'll find me. That's perfect. That. Now we appreciate you spending time with us today. Yep. Uh, guys, uh, thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it as much as we did and uh, we will see you again. Bye-bye. Right, see you guys. Be at, be at peace, folks.